Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. And at question number one, I call Ben McPherson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support the City of Edinburgh Council and other organisations to provide suitable temporary accommodation and more social housing in Edinburgh. Minister Paul McLennan. We are investing £752 million this year through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme to support the delivery of more social and affordable homes towards our 110,000 target affordable homes by 2032. Working with social landlords to make best use of existing homes and implementing targeted partnership plans with local authorities facing the greatest pressure. Since 2007, we have supported the delivery of 6,255 social homes in Edinburgh. I have met with Edinburgh's housing convener several times to discuss the Council's proposals to improve temporary accommodation and increase housing supply, which will inform a partnership plan. Ben McPherson. I am grateful for that answer and welcome all of it. However, the Minister will be aware of the severity of the situation here in Edinburgh. Shelter Scotland have called it an emergency and I am increasingly concerned about the correspondence I am receiving from constituents. Homelessness applications have increased by over 20 per cent. Therefore, can the Scottish Government provide any additional help to City of Edinburgh Council and other relevant organisations to provide more suitable temporary accommodation? And can the Scottish Government do more to fund and prioritise building and delivering more social housing here in Edinburgh, given the current pressures and projected population growth? Paul McLennan. Our aim is to prevent homelessness. However, when it does occur, we are taking the housing-led uh, response to provide households with settled homes as quickly as possible. We provide local authorities with annual allocations of £8 million RRTP funding to support people into settled accommodation, uh, and with £30.5 million with their work to prevent homelessness, with Edinburgh receiving over £3.8 million in 2023-24. During this Parliament, to maximise the delivery of social and affordable homes to support strategic housing and investment plan priorities, we are making a record £234 million available to Edinburgh, with an additional £10 million this year being allocated. Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I agree with Ben McPherson. And here in Edinburgh, the number of children currently living in temporary accommodation stands at 2,755, an increase of 13 per cent compared to last year. President Officer, that is almost a third of children in Scotland currently living in temporary accommodation here in the capital alone. Today we see a situation escalating out of control. It is time for SNP and Green Ministers to take responsibility and declare a housing emergency. So will the Minister urgently ag agree to chair a cross-government temporary accommodation task force to help address the situation here in the capital? Minister. Thank you. Uh, as I'll refer to my, my previous answer. I've been working very closely with uh, Edinburgh Council since being uh, in post. Um, uh, since being in post, uh, including uh, looking at the, the, the individual partnership plan we were talking about, and we're discussing proposals uh, as we are at the moment. Mr. Briggs will be aware that I also attended the Edinburgh Housing Summit, uh, which was brought together by Alex Cole Hamilton. And I understand there's going to be a further meeting uh, beyond that. Happy to meet with Mr. Briggs to discuss some of these proposals. We are looking at opportunities around the individual. Uh, things we need to do in Edinburgh and also how we can bring forward additional social housing in Edinburgh. I'm happy to discuss further with Mr Briggs. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I declare a register of interest in my former work with the SFHA. Minister, there have been a series of cross-party meetings this year. It's an urgent issue, Edinburgh's housing crisis. It needs leadership and funding. The gap is £418 million. So what's the Scottish Government going to do now to tackle the scale of homelessness, lack of affordable housing, and critically this month, the lack of housing for students that they can afford? Minister. Yeah, as I said, we already attended a housing summit that was brought together by Alex Cole Hamilton, and, and I understand there was a follow-up planned for that. As I said before, I have already met with Edinburgh's housing convener on a number of occasions, and we are dis uh, discussing specific proposals as we speak at, at, that, at that moment. Happy to discuss further with Sarah Boyack. Question number two, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made towards the introduction of speed awareness courses, among other diversion schemes for driving offences, as an alternative to prosecution. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government supports the principle of driver education as an alternative to prosecution where this is appropriate. The Lord Advocate has agreed in principle to the introduction of road traffic diversionary courses, including speed awareness courses in Scotland. 
A multi-agency working group comprising of key delivery partners was set up to oversee the delivery of this initiative and the Scottish Government continues to discuss the importance of implementing speed awareness courses with Police Scotland as the lead partner for delivery who are currently reviewing the project's timings. Colette Stevenson. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the speeding awareness courses are a good way of reaching offenders and challenging their driving behaviour? With research from Down South showing that people who tend to go on these courses are less likely to reoffend. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I do indeed agree with the member and the, the Scottish Government is very much in agreement that speed awareness courses specifically will have a positive impact on driver behaviour through effective education. The published research in this matter is very important. It shows that uh, these interventions do reduce the number of re-offenders who have uh, attended such courses uh, as a result and also has a, a longer term impact on improving driver behaviour. Uh, and that's why this government is working with their key partners uh, to deliver this important road safety initiative to make our roads safer. Thank you. Question number three, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will anticipate it will receive the Scottish Law Commission's findings and recommendations arising from its consultation on damages for personal injury. Minister Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Law Commission's discussion paper on damages for personal injury was published on the 23rd of February 2022, and the consultation period ended on the 30th of June 2022. The Commission is currently in the process of analysing consultee views submitted in response to the discussion paper and formulating policy with the aim of publishing its findings and report with accompanying draft bill by mid-2024. Marie McNair. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. The Scottish Law Commission recommendations will cover the issue of time bar and some routes to compensation for people seeking damages because of exposure to asbestos. Will the Minister make representations to the Scottish Law Commission to request that the report is published as soon as possible? And will she commit to early action on the report's recommendation? Finally, will the Minister meet with me and representatives of Clybank Asbestos Group to hear their testimony about how this injustice is impacting on their members? Minister. Thank you. It's for the Scottish Law Commission to establish a timetable for its work, but I expect the Commission to publish those recommendations by mid-2024. The Scottish Government will, of course, give careful consideration to the recommendations, and I'll be happy to meet with the member and Clyde Asbestos Group to discuss them when we receive them. Question number four, John Mason. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the potential introduction of strict liability in Scottish football. Minister Marie Todd. We have never ruled out strict liability as an option. However, our preferred solution has always been that the footballing authorities in Scotland proactively shape and deliver a robust and meaningful solution to tackle any unacceptable conduct by what is a minority of supporters. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that uh, answer. We have had a huge amount of antisocial behaviour in Glasgow, including in my constituency, by some football fans in recent times particularly around George Square by Rangers fans and Glasgow Cross by Celtic fans. And would she agree that the clubs need to take some more responsibility eh, as they do when it's a European Championship? Minister. So while the vast majority of football supporters are well behaved, that it clearly remains a problem which everyone who is able to influence and to change must work together to eradicate. It's important that we don't lose sight of the collective need for action to achieve a zero tolerance approach towards any offensive and antisocial behaviour. And that includes football authorities and the clubs as much as everyone else. As I've already said, our preferred solution has always been that footballing authorities in Scotland proactively shape and deliver a robust and meaningful solution to tackle any unacceptable conduct by what is definitely a minority of supporters. But we've never ruled out strict liability as an option, and we're well aware that clubs are subject to strict liability while participating in UEFA-run competitions. We'll continue to work with the footballing authorities, Police Scotland and fans groups to address issues and to ensure that football matches are an enjoyable experience for everyone. Thank you. Question number five, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken to eliminate sexual harassment in schools. Minister Emma Roddick. The Scottish Government is... The Scottish Government is clear that harassment or abuse of any form, whether that is in the workplace, schools, at home or in society in general, is completely reprehensible and must stop. 
As we set out in the 2023-24 programme for government, we are committed to publishing a national framework to better support schools in tackling gender-based violence and sexual harassment at the end of this year. That will help ensure that consistent messages on sexual harassment and gender-based violence are given to everyone working with children and young people and will support our commitment to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls. Ross Greer. Thank you. I welcome the steps that the Minister has outlined. The principle of consent is an essential component of effective education on sex and relationships. But we know from evidence heard in Parliament previously that many young people receive sex and relationships education without consent being covered. All children and young people, but particularly boys and young men, should receive education on the importance of consent. Does the, cabinet, sorry, does the Minister agree that this is essential if we are to tackle so-called rape culture and sexual violence, particularly against women and girls, both in schools and in wider society? Minister. Yes, I absolutely agree with the member. Consent is a critical component in our commitment to tackle violence against women and girls. Through our relationships, sexual health and parenthood education, our children and young people do learn about gender equality, consent and the law, as well as sexual harassment. And these are key topics in helping children and young people develop their knowledge and understanding of how to have better, healthier relationships. This government also published a resource for professionals to help and support young people aged 11 to 18 in their understanding of healthy relationships and consent. The key messages for young people on healthy relationships and consent sets out that relationships should be mutually respectful, consensual, positive, healthy and enjoyable. Stephanie Callaghan. President Officer, the government conducted a consultation in 2020 around challenging men's de demand for prostitution, working to reduce the harms associated with prostitution and helping women to exit prostitution. Can the Minister say how has this shaped the Government's approach to ending sexual violence against women and girls? Minister. The Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to ending violence against women and girls and we are focused on delivering, delivering a framework that effectively tackles and challenges men's demand for prostitution and to see it operating and tested to the full. That aligns with the equally safe strategies definition of violence against women and girls and I would direct the member to Justice colleagues for any more information that she might require. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Of course, we should have zero tolerance when it comes to sexual harassment, but we should have zero tolerance to all harassment, especially in schools. So why is it taking the Cabinet Secretary five months to organise a summit on school violence that she said she'd hold? Minister. I would tell the member that really good progress has been made recently um, in drafting the national framework and the expectation is that the framework is going to be published early in the new year and at the moment the working group that we have set up is currently engaging directly with stakeholders uh, with key interests in areas covered by the framework and I would just reassure him that this is an issue we take absolutely seriously and I think that's something that we can share. Question number six, Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that increasing Numbers of dentists are leaving the NHS. Minister Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister's policy prospectus has set out the Government's primary objective of sustaining and improving patient access to NHS dental services. Reform of the payment system is essential to the sustainability of patient access to NHS dental services. In this connection, I wrote to the dental sector on the 27th of July to provide details of changes to be introduced on the 1st of November this year. Willie Rennie. I'm a bit surprised the Minister didn't start off with an apology. An apology that the SNP have ditched Absolutely. another manifesto commitment to abolish NHS dental charges. In fact, the charges aren't just staying static, they're going up. But can the Minister tell the Chamber how many dentists will join the NHS and do more NHS work as a result of these changes? Because she knows the NHS dentistry is on its knees. Minister. I thank Mr Rennie for his question. I think we also need to point out, though, that NHS dentists are working incredibly hard with many back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, I, as I was clear when we made our announcement on the 27th of July, this is a first step to reforming dental uh, practices, dental payments, 
um, and governments and workforce. And we are working incredibly hard with the NHS boards and dentists to ensure that we understand and move forward um, to improve the way that dentists are coming in. We currently have 183 students going through dental training just now. Mr Rennie will remember that we lost 160 as a result of the COVID pandemic, but we are making aims to try and uh, uh, return more dentists to, to the sector to ensure that we maintain the incredibly important NHS dental services that support people in Scotland to ensure they have really good oral health. Question number seven, Rose McCall. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve hospital services across NHS Fife. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I expect all health boards, including NHS Fife, to keep their services under review to ensure that they are of the highest quality and meet the needs of local people, while remaining consistent with national policies and frameworks. <laughs> Ros McCall. Uh, thank you for the answer. The people of Dunfermline are quite rightly proud of their newfound city status. The city is now one of the fastest growing in the UK with, uh, in terms of population, with another 1,400 houses due for construction. Unfortunately, the city's health provision at St Margaret's Hospital is not reflected in this. Chemotherapy unit closed and relocated to Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy. Accident and emergency department closed. Maternity unit closed. People are suffering unnecessarily due to these service centralisations. So my question for the Cabinet Secretary is quite simple. When will the people of Scotland's new city get the hospital services they deserve? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, we expect NHS Fife, like other health boards, to work in partnership with their local planning partners, including within the Fife area, to look at how they can configure services to meet the needs of the local community, including in the way in which services are divided between uh, Victoria Hospital and also between uh, Queen Margaret Hospital. The member will also be aware that we actually have made significant investment in Queen Margaret Hospital over recent years. Yep. We've put in a state-of-the-art surgical and diagnostic services provision, new minor injuries uh, unit. We've also created a new community and child services centre there and the provision of a comprehensive antenatal and postnatal care service uh, for the local community. But no doubt NHS Fife will want to continue to review services going forward to make sure they meet the needs of the local community. Thank you. Question number eight, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what additional resources will be made available to NHS Highland in light of the reports of an estimated annual overspend of £55 million. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the 2023-24 budget provides increased investment of £42.5 million for NHS Highland, meaning that the board's funding has increased by over 83% since 2006-07. In addition, a further £14.6 million has been provided in year to support financial sustainability. The Scottish Government continues to work with all NHS boards to monitor their financial performance and support the delivery of fiscal sustainability, including providing additional support to NHS Highland to support financial recovery. Edward Mountain. I'm not sure what additional support of the, that lays out, because the consequences of the position we're in is the cancellation of elected surgery. Added to this, the lack of an interventional radiologist and now the lack of a cardiovascular surgeon means that a perfect storm is brewing. How is this government going to really help NH NHS Highland tackle these problems? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I've just set out the additional financial support we've given this year and also the additional £14.6 million we've we'll provided for uh, this financial year again to help to support financial sustainability. And we are continuing to engage with them around the financial challenges which they face and also to support them in some of the recruitment challenges which they have as well. But the member will also be aware of the very significant investment we have recently made in NHS Highland through one of our national treatment centres, which is a facility of over £40 million. It's providing improvements in the way in which care is being provided to patients in a range of elective procedures. Thank you. That concludes general questions.